hi guys welcome back to my channel i am so happy to see you all here so in this video i want to talk about the suitable approach to perform differential expression analysis in single cell rna seq data and in this video we will be covering what is suitable analysis uh, why we need to take that approach and lastly i want to demonstrate how to perform this analysis so for our single cell data uh, this is essentially the format for our feature barcode matrix where we have rows as genes and each column here is a cell so there are certain cells a uh, group of cells that belong to a particular biological replicate or sample and similarly we have two groups here so we have some group of cells and rep that belong to some replicates and these replicates or samples belong to the control condition and we have some group of cells that belong to some replicate and they belong to the treated condition and essentially for the pseudo bulk approach what we want to do is we want to aggregate the counts for those cells belonging to a particular uh, replicate or sample so essentially what we have is uh, such a format where we have one count value for a gene for one replicate or sample this is more like a bulk count matrix so we are essentially converting the single cell uh, feature barcode matrix into more sort of a bulk where we have the counts for aggregated for the sample or the replicate level and not at the single cell level um and once we have such a format then maybe we can leverage the existing um rna seq differential expression frameworks like de seq2 hr and lemma the most obvious question at this point would be uh, why are we pseudo bulking our data we already have functions to perform differential expression analysis like in the previous video we used a uh, find markers function to find canonical markers uh, for each cluster by comparing the cluster to all the other clusters as well as we could find genes that were differentially expressed due to the treatment uh, in a particular cell type so why do we need um, pseudo bulking and why can't we just stick to the methods that are developed for uh, single cell data uh pseudo bulking approaches are taken uh because uh single cell rna seq data uh differ from bulk rna seq data on a lot of aspects like uh single cell rna seq data has a lot of zero counts uh in addition to that it has a complicated distribution as well as it poses huge heterogeneity uh between and even within cell populations and this heterogeneity poses major challenges for differential gene expression analysis in single cell rna seq data uh studies have shown that single cell methods tend to identify uh, highly expressed genes as differentially expressed and it exhibits low sensitivity for genes that have low expression um also these single cell methods uh, tend to inflate the p values because it treats each cell as a sample uh, however that should not be the case because um the sample because, because the cells are not truly independent of each other as they are isolated from the same organism or sample from the same environment they cannot be considered as um samples because they are not truly independent of each other and if cells are treated as samples then the comparisons that we make are we are making at the individual level between the cells and we are not truly uh, looking at the variation across the population pseudo bulking approaches can dramatically reduce the number of zeros um in the data especially for the genes that have low expression and at the same time we can also leverage the statistical rigor of uh, existing bulk uh, rna seq uh, differential expression methods like de seq2 hr and lemma it also takes care of situations where the cells are correlated to each other um, as they are uh, isolated from the same organism or uh, the same sample so uh, aggregating the counts at the sample level uh, makes each sample be represented only once in a condition which can avoid the problems of correlation between the samples and lastly if you want to truly um, investigate the effect of a condition or an effect of a treatment on genes it is important for us to look at the differences at the population level and not at the individual level uh, and hence pseudo bulking uh, makes more sense because we are aggregating the counts at the sample level and we are comparing these samples as opposed to the single cells now that we've spoken about what is a uh, pseudo bulk analysis and why do we take that approach uh, finally i want to demonstrate how do we perform this analysis so we will require um these packages today so experiment hub is a resource where we can get uh, curated data from experiments and publications so we are going to use an annotated data today uh then we will use some functions from the serat package to aggregate the counts across the cells uh, at the sample level and once we have the counts aggregated we will use um a commonly used bulk rna seq uh, differential expression method called de seq2 
uh, I have previously made videos on this uh, talking about how DESeq2 works as well as how to perform differential expression analysis using DESeq2. And lastly, uh, we will use Tidyverse to manipulate the data. So let's switch screens to our studio now to get started. This tutorial is going to be more heavy on the data manipulation steps because we need to uh, run a bunch of steps to get our data from the single cell and aggregate um, the counts to the sample level. So let's start by first um, running and loading the libraries. Now that our libraries are loaded, the following steps uh, will be to get the data from the experiment hub. I'm following the steps that they have provided in their vignette. So um, I will add the link to their vignette in the description below. So make sure you check that out if you are not sure uh, how to get data from experiment hub. So let's start by uh, getting the experiment hub object and this object will tell you what data it has from what provider the species the data class it has all of that information let's query the object we want the Kang data so when I run this I get a list of um, I get information on all the uh, data that's associated with Kang. So essentially I'm interested in this data set. So let's get that data. So I'm going to get the data and I'm going to use the succession ID. And when I run this, this is a single cell data that's associated with um, that uh, data set so this is the single set experiment class and this is the data but i want the data as a serat object and i do not wish to use the single cell uh, experiment object so let's convert this into a serat object And save it into an object so this is my Serat object all right so now let's take a look at our object and now we can see that we have retrieved the data that's associated with the Kang data set and the data is um, in the Serat as a Serat object let's quickly take a look at the metadata as I said that I'm using the annotated data I'm just interested to see whether the annotations are present and uh, we have the annotations for each cell as to what type of cell um, it is and in addition to that we have information on the condition as to what cells belong to the control and what cells belong to the stimulator as well as it seems that this data set has been run on a doublet finder um, algorithm because certain cells are um, identified or predicted as doublets and certain cells are uh, predicted as singlets so we would essentially want to filter out the doublets in our uh, filtering steps coming to the qc and filtering i encourage you to explore uh, the qc by visualizing your data and coming up with ratios to filter your uh, cells as I will not be going into the details of this today. If you're not sure how to do that, make sure you check my earlier video out where I have spoken about how to analyze single cell RNA-seq data um, using Serat workflow where I have gone into the details of this. So if you're not sure how to do that, make sure you check uh, that video out. Uh, let's calculate the percentage of transcripts that map to mitochondrial genes. So we can do that by percentage feature set. We provide it with the name of the object and the pattern for the gene. It starts with MT and saving it to the object and create a new uh, column in the metadata called mito percent, which will hold these percentage values. So quickly taking a look at that, um, we can see that um, those read percentages, um, the transcript percentages that map to that reads have been calculated. It seems that almost all cells have zero um, mitochondrial uh, genes being expressed. Uh, so now let's filter the low quality cells. So we use the subset function and we provide the name of the object. And now we provide the thresholds by which we want to filter. So we want to um, 
keep all uh, those cells where the feature the feature column here is called n feature underscore original experiment so original experiment so we want to keep all the cells that have greater than 200 genes and less than 2500 genes and keeping all those cells with greater than 800 transcript counts and keeping all the cells that has mitochondrial read per, uh, gene percentage at least less than 5%. It seems that most cells have 0%, uh, but we are going with the 5% uh, threshold here. And finally, we want to um, get only those cells which are predicted as singlet uh, from the multiplets column. So we want only singlet, just making sure that I'm specifying the right value and the right column name here. And now let's assign it to a new variable um, called serat filter. And now let's run this. Okay, so it says that I have, I have an error that says that n count original experiment not found. So I have not uh, used the right column name. So it seems I have misspelled the column name. It should be original experiment. After filtering our data, let's take a look at how many cells we started with. So we started with around 29,000 cells. And after filtering, we are left with around 22,000 cells. Now let's visualize our data first before we um, aggregate our data to the sample level. So we will uh, run Sarat's standard workflow steps. So we start by normalizing data. Let's assign it back to the filter object, followed by find variable features. After finding variable features, we scale the data. After scaling, we run linear dimensionality reduction. Now that we've finished running the PCA, let's determine the dimensionality of the data. So we will run an elbow plot. And quickly taking a look at the elbow plot, um, it seems that the first 15 principal components seem to capture the majority of the variation, but I'm going to err on the higher side and consider the first 20. So using the first 20 uh, principal components, we will run UMAP, uh, which is non-linear dimensionality reduction. And let's save it back to the filtered object. Now that our UMAP has finished running, let's visualize the data. So I want to visualize the data two ways. I want to group my uh, cells as per the type of uh, the cluster or the type of the cells that the cluster is, that, that forms the cluster. And I want to group the cells by condition. So let's create a dimension plot use the reductions UMAP and group the cell by the annotations. So my annotations are present in the cell column. So I'm going to group it by cell. And I'm going to save it into a variable called cell plot. And similarly, I'm creating another dimension plot to group my cells by the condition. And the condition is present in stim column. 
going to save this to a variable called condition plot and now let's run this commands and visualize them side by side I forgot to add the label as true because I want to see the labels on the cluster so I'm going to add the label as true in the cell plot so rerunning it again and recreating the final plot so zooming in on my plot so you can see that cells on my left are colored and labeled as per the cell type and uh, cells on my right are colored and labeled as per the condition and you can see that my cells are not integrated across conditions and for this analysis it really does not matter whether my data is integrated or not because the data that I am accessing today and I will be using is the raw counts and even if you use an integrated data the method which returns the correct uh, expression matrix will use the normalized data the data from the data slot and not from the count slot which stores the raw counts and hence it really does not matter whether um, you have integrated data or um, non-integrated data so what I wish to do today is to make comparisons in my B cells uh, between two conditions that is uh, the stimulated and the control conditions by aggregating the counts uh, to the sample levels in these conditions and comparing between the samples and essentially identifying genes that have different expression patterns uh, in the uh, stimulated group versus the control group. So in order for us to do that, we have to uh, aggregate the counts across the cells uh, to the sample level and for that we will run a bunch of data manipulation steps. Uh, I will try to make it as intuitive as possible, uh, but if something's not clear, uh, please make sure you leave your questions or doubts in the comment section below and I will try my best to answer them and um, try to make it more intuitive. So before going into the data manipulation, the first thing I want to do is I want to take a look at um, the metadata. And what I want to do is that in this column that is IND, it has information about the individuals that is the sample ID. And I want to add uh, the, uh, the condition information to this as well. So I want to create a new column with both the um, sample IDs as well as the condition information. So let's create that. So I want to name it as samples and we want to essentially add information from two columns so the first would be the uh, condition and the sample ID and let's view our metadata again and now we have uh, the sample column with both that information for the next step let's um, run a function to aggregate the counts across the cells so there is a function called aggregate expression the first uh, parameter is the name of the object the second parameter would be group by so we have to um, provide it uh, how to group the cells and aggregate so we want to group by two things so going back to the metadata the first thing I want to group by is the cell type and for within each cell type I want to group by the individual or the sample name. So since we have that information stored here we will be using the sample columns so I will be using group by cells and samples. The next parameter is assays. And this will be our default assay. We can quickly check that um, using default assay function. And original experiment is a default assay. So we can use that. And the next parameter is slot. And I'm using count slot because I will be I want to aggregate my counts and I will be using DESeq, which uses raw counts. And lastly, I do not want to return a Serat object. So I want to quickly save this in a variable called counts and run this. If you check the counts object, um, you can see that it is a list and within a list we have a matrix. So let us get the counts data. So I'm just going to extract it from 
the matrix and now when we look at the counts we can see a huge matrix with uh, the columns uh, as the type of the cell and the sample name or the sample id and the numbers as the counts and we have the rows as genes so as we scroll down we can see that some genes have some numbers for counts but there are a lot of zeros in here so if you remember we grouped the cells we wanted to aggregate by the cell types and the samples so that's how it aggregated the cells first it grouped the cells by the cell type and then it aggregated for each um, type of uh, sample within it for each of the gene so for the next steps what i want to do is i want to split this large matrix according to cell type and I will do that by first transposing this matrix such that my columns become my rows and the rows will become the columns. And after that, I will want to split my rows according to the cell type into a list sort of an object where each element would correspond to a matrix associated with a cell type. Um, why I would want to do that will make more sense once I do it and we reach at that step. It will be more clear as to why having such a um, structure would be more beneficial to us. So let's transpose it first by using the transpose function. And let's convert this transposed data into a data frame. And then let's uh, see how it looks like. So now that we have converted into a data frame, let's quickly take a look at what do we have. So as you can see that now um, our columns, which were the cell type and the sample names uh, became our rows and the rows, which were our genes became our columns. So for the next steps, I will split this transposed uh, matrix according to the cell type. So I first need to get the cell type information from the rows. And since it also has the um, sample ID along with the condition, I need to get rid of uh, this pattern that is any anything after the underscore and the values. I need to get rid of it so that I can get only uh, the cell type information here. So we can get that by uh, using gsub function and I'm using a regular expression here where I'm matching anything that is after the underscore and I'm replacing it with nothing. So basically I'm removing it and this would be the row names of the transposed matrix and I will save it into a variable called split columns or rather split rows. And taking a look at the split rows, you can see that now we have uh, this vector containing the cell types. So this uh, vector can be used um, as a factor variable when we are using uh, it to split the uh, data frame. So we split the data frame using a function called split data frame. And the first parameter is the name of the data frame that we want to split. And we define a grouping variable by providing it the uh, factor variable, uh, the variable which contains all the um, cell types that we obtained from the previous command. And now let's save this to another variable called count split. Now that this has finished running, let's take a look at count split. And this is something what we wanted. So it returned a list with each element corresponding to a cell type. And each of this element corresponds to the matrix that is associated with the cell type. So taking a quick look at one of the element, the first one is B cell, so we're going to go with that. And taking a look at first and rows and columns, we can see that now this matrix corresponds to B cells and the rows here are the B cells along with the sample IDs and the columns here are the genes and the values are the count, uh, count values. So here we have a matrix that only corresponds to the aggregated values for B cells across all the samples and it has information for all the genes. So this is what we wanted. Uh, for the next steps, what we want is, as you can see that we need to um, retranspose our uh, matrix. So we now need to make our rows as the gene names and the columns as the uh, sample IDs. And we also need to fix the uh, column names. We need to get rid of the cell type names from the column names.
So as I said, I want to perform some operations like um, transposing the matrix, retransposing the matrix, as well as removing uh, the cell type names from uh, the row names. So I want to perform this operation on all the elements of the uh, list object. And for that, we use a function called lapply, which performs these operations on all the list objects and returns a list object as well. So the first parameter of L apply is the name of the um, list object, which is count split. And the second parameter is a function. And we will write some things in the function which performs both of these um, uh, tasks. But before I go into that detail, I want to talk about the regular expression that I will be using uh, to remove the cell type names from the row names here. So I will be using G sub. And essentially what I want to do is that I want to retain everything that's after the underscore. So here is our underscore and I want to match everything before it and everything after it. But I want to retain everything after the underscore. So I will be putting them in a group by putting it in the parenthesis and then I will retain or replace it by only that group. So let's quickly run an example here. So let's say we have this string. And just to test whether my regular expression works, uh, I'm running this. And now you can see that out of this entire string, I wrote a regular expression uh, to match a pattern in such a way that I only retain everything after the underscore. And that's how we have the control 101. We, that's what we, that, that is what we essentially want. So I'm just going to comment it out and I want to use this in my function. So I will be using it on all the row names uh, in each element. So each element is X. So I, for each element, I will be using that and each element in our list object is a matrix. So for all the matrix row names, I want to use the regular expression. So I will want to match it with this expression and return the first group and the string here would again be the row names and after i do that i want to transpose it because i fixed my uh, row names here and now i can make them into my column names and i want the gene uh, names as to be my row names so i transpose it and now let's save the returned list into another variable called split modified. And now let's run this. Let us check whether um, the changes that we uh, were hoping to make were successfully uh, made in our uh, count split modified um, list. So again, we will be looking at the B cell element and looking at the first 10 rows and the columns. Now you can see that our row names have become the gene names and the column names have become the sample names and IDs and um, it has been, uh, been rid of the uh, cell type name. So this is exactly what we wanted. We went into a long rigmarole of data manipulation steps uh, for us to have the data looking like this because recall that we wanted to compare the expression of genes um, in B cells across different conditions. And here we wanted our um, counts data to be aggregated uh, uh, at the sample level. So that's exactly what we have. This is the data that's specific to B cells and data aggregated to the sample level. So now we can use this uh, counts matrix uh, into uh, a DEC a data set. We can build a DEC data set using the count matrix and we can run DEC analysis. The following uh, steps are from the DEC workflow. So let us first start by getting our counts matrix. So we want to compare um, within uh, B cells. So we need to get uh, data that is specific to B cells. So let us get counts for B cell and we get it from the count split modified and the first element that is the B cell. So this is our counts matrix. To take a look at it quickly, we will just open it in our viewer and we can see as we scroll down, there are some genes that have uh, some count values. So this is our counts matrix and we have the counts aggregated at the sample level. So this is 
what we want. This resembles the bulk data. And as we do not have the metadata for um, the um, samples here, we can create one for ourselves. So let's start by creating a data frame which has samples which corresponds to the column names in the counts p cell. So this is our call data. And now we need another column here, which is condition, which can tell us which samples belong to the control and which samples belong to the stimulated group. And we can leverage the information that's present in the sample names that we have the control or the stim um, string within the sample name. So we can use that to um, classify whether the sample belongs to the control or the stimulated group. So, And do that by running mutate and condition if else there is stim present in um, the samples then make provided the value stimulated otherwise control and let's make sure this is run correctly so looks like this is run successfully this is exactly what we want so now let's make the um, sample column into row names because we that's how it will run successfully so we need to make samples into row names and now let's assign it back to call data and once again opening the call data so now we have the column names here that corresponds to the column row names here that corresponds to the call names in the matrix and it corresponds to a condition where we will use this for our this is this is going to be a design variable where we can group uh, the samples according to the condition and make such comparisons so now let's create a d seek to object using the seek data from matrix where our count data is counts underscore b cell our call data is call data and the design is we want to compare between condition that is between control and stimulated group and now let's assign this to a variable uh, now that the data set has been created the uh, the seek data set object has been created now let's filter it so let's remove all the genes that have lower than 10 reads want to keep all the genes that have at least 10 reads in total and can subset our uh, DC data set and finally let's run dseq now that this has finished running let's get result names And we would want to generate a result where stimulated group is con compared with the control group. So it is results rather I get an error it's results. And now let's take a look at the results. So we finally get genes that are differentially expressed um, in B cells between the stimulated group and the control group. And the comparisons we made here uh, were between the samples and not between the cells. Uh, we get the associated log fold changes, uh, the statistic and the associated p-values and the adjusted p-values. Uh, if you're not sure on how to interpret these values, I have explained them in detail in my DEC2 workflow video. So please make sure you check that out. 
using this results various downstream analysis like um, gene set enrichment analysis can be performed to identify the gene sets that are enriched in the stimulated group versus the control in b cells similarly this analysis can also be repeated for other cell types uh, if you want to compare the changes in gene expression uh, between the stimulator and the control group so that brings me to the end of this video. Um, I hope you found this video helpful and informative. Um, I know this video was a little intense in terms of data manipulation steps, but I tried to make it as intuitive as I could. Um, as always, I will upload my script to my GitHub and I will add the link to my GitHub repository in the description below. As well as I will add links to additional resources, which I think will help you understand some of the things a little better. And if you found this video uh, helpful, please make sure you hit the subscribe button, like the video, share it and leave your comments under the comment section. Until next time, see you.